Yato dakang durge vrishtam parvate shu vidhavati Evang dharman pratak pasyang stane vanu vidhavati As water rained on an inaccessible height gets dispersed on lower hilly regions, similarly, one who perceives the selves differently runs after them only. Shankaracharya's Tika Yata as Udakam water Brushtam ord Durge on an inaccessible place or height Vidhavati flows being dispersed becomes dissipated Arvateshu over hilly lower regions, evam, similarly, ashyan, seeing, dharman, the selves, pratak, differently in everybody, anuvidhavati, one runs after, taneva, them only, those souls that conform to the different bodies. The meaning is that he assumes different bodies again and again. Yato da kang shudhe shudham asiktam tadrigeva bhavati evang munir vijanata atma bhavati gautama. O Gautama, as pure water poured on pure water becomes verily the same, so also does become the self of the man of knowledge who is given to deliberation on the self. Shankaracharya's Tika Now is being stated how the nature of the self is attained by a man of realization, for whom the perception of difference that is created by limiting adjuncts has been destroyed, who sees the non-dual self, which is a homogeneous mass of pure consciousness, who is possessed of knowledge, and is engaged in meditation. Yata as Shuddham Udakam, pure water, Asiktam, being poured, Shuddhe, on pure water, Bhavati, becomes, Adrigeva, of the same quality, Atma, the self, too, Bhavati, becomes, Evam, so, Vijanata, of one who knows, realizes unity. Muneh, of one who deliberates. Gautama, O son of Gautama. Therefore, giving up the perception of duality that bad logicians teach and the erroneous notions that the non-believers entertain, the people whose pride has been quelled should eagerly seek after the realization of the unity of the self that is inculcated by the Vedas that are more beneficent than thousands of fathers and mothers. This is the idea. Namaste. So here we are at the conclusion of the fourth chapter of Katupanishad. And we have a simile about water. The first verse, verse 14, talks about what happens to the consciousness of a distracted soul <laughs> who is not focused on Brahman. And he compares it to water dropped from an inaccessible height, like a great waterfall. And of course, when it hits the rocks below, it scatters. It goes every which way. It doesn't remain together. Instead, it becomes scattered all over the foothills below, runs off in several different streams and so on. And this is compared to the unconcentrated being who has no intelligence. Huh? Just like Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, those who are fixed on God, their aim is one. The intelligence of those who are not devotees 
is many branched. It runs off in all directions. And so what happens? One takes one body after another, one form after another, trying to reach some desires, some materialistic goals. And of course, even if they are reached, it's not satisfactory. It's not pleasurable because those things, whatever the objects of the desires are, keep breaking down. They keep changing. Everything in this world is temporary. So it cannot give the full satisfaction that we're always craving. However, he compares the concentrated mind of the pure soul with water, pure water, that's poured into another container of pure water. And of course, they're both the same quality. So in the same way, one who realizes his self can understand that I am Brahman, aham brahmasmi. I am of the same quality as Brahman. And in fact, I am indistinguishable from Brahman. Brahman is one. So even though Brahman appears to be present in so many living forms, that's only because the consciousness, energy, and life in those forms is reflected. It's not original. It's not the actual Brahman, simply a reflection. We went over that back in the Drik Drishya Vivekaha series, that what appears to be energy, consciousness, intelligence, and life in the material world in these bodies is simply a reflection of the actual source, which is one. Why is it one? Because Brahman, by definition, has no boundaries. When something becomes divided, even into two, there has to be a boundary, huh? like you see in mitosis, in cell division. The cells, the, the nuclei split, and then they draw apart, and then gradually a membrane of boundary forms between the two cells, the two daughter cells, as they're called. But this cannot happen in Brahman. Why then does Brahman appear to divide itself into the superior and inferior, the Shiva and Shakti, Brahman without qualities, and Brahman with qualities? Nirguna Brahman and Saguna Brahman. Well, it's Maya. It's an illusion. It's not really true. It can't be true. So what happens is the Maya is always changing. It's the opposite of Brahman. And have you ever seen the yin-yang symbol? One side is white, the other side is black. Huh? Well, and each one has the opposite color within it at the core. And why is that? Because viewed in duality, Brahman seems to change, but actually it doesn't change. It only changes because it's a reflection. <laughs> that uh, reflection that appears in darkness says Srimad Bhagavatam. So what is the thing about the material world? It's full of ignorance. I don't know what's going to happen even five minutes from now. And the farther away I consider what's going to happen, the, the less my odds of getting it right are. What's going to happen tomorrow? is less predictable than what's going to happen in five minutes. What's going to happen next year? Nobody gets that right. You look at all these prediction columns, you know? The only people that get anything right are the Vedic astrologers. <laughs> and that's because they understand the system of how the reality is reflected in Maya. And so they're following the Vedic principles 
looking at the reality and how it is fragmented into pieces, really, by the planets. How time is structured according to qualities, the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. And so that's why there are so many different explanations, uh, predictions, variations in philosophy, and different opinions about what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, and so on. Because the modes of nature are constantly in competition with one another, each one trying to be, become the most prominent at every moment. Sometimes goodness wins, sometimes it's passion, other times it's ignorance. So to actually reach self-realization, one has to take control of these modes. One has to, first of all, find them in oneself and then observe them and finally figure out how they're working. Why is water used as a simile? Because it has three modes also. Ice, liquid water, and water vapor. And these are exactly analogous to earth, water, and air, or fire. Fire and air are very closely related. Without air, you can't have fire. So they are very closely related as cause and effect. So the steam that comes, or the evaporated water that uh, happens when the sun is hot, are products of heat, fire. But they also are like air because they're gaseous, they uh, float in the air, and so on. So in the same way, water has three states, and these are compared to ignorance, passion, and goodness. Liquid water is goodness. It always follows its dharma. It flows downhill to the ocean. That's what liquid water does, and you can't make it do <laughs> anything different. It ultimately reaches the ocean, or it evaporates, and that's the mode of passion. Or it freezes, that's the mode of ignorance. So water is a very apt choice for this simile regarding the untamed soul who goes through so many changes, huh? Now he's water, now he's ice, now he's water vapor. Huh? But always coming back to the form water. So in the same way, we may try this and that, we may go through different stages, but we always come back to goodness because goodness is what leads to pleasure. That's also stated in Bhagavad Gita in chapter 18. The mode of goodness leads to happiness. The mode of passion leads to ignorance, and ignorance is just suffering. Why does the mode of passion lead to ignorance? Because its objects are illusory. You think you're going to get happiness by desiring this and that and chasing after it in the material world. But the only thing that you actually get is trouble, isn't it? Just look back at your life, how every time you tried to attain some material goal, it wound up being a cause of suffering. Be honest with yourself. Most people aren't. Most people rationalize it. Well, something, you know, changed and it messed up my plans and whatever. But actually, if you look at it, it always happens that way. It's not possible to live in this material world and chase these material goals without causing yourself suffering. That's why the sadhus follow the mode of goodness. They eat little, sleep little, they meditate a lot, they study, they read, they chant, and most of all, they contemplate the meaning of all their experience both within the realm of Vedic studies and outside in their interactions with the world. And they come to the same conclusion. 
The same conclusion that's being taught here, that when you run after the items, desirable things in the material world, you become scattered, you lose yourself. And this is what's happening, especially in Western culture, which is spread all over the world now. People are losing themselves, losing their sense of right and wrong, becoming crazy, becoming violent, because they can't get what they want. They can't get happiness. Well, of course not. They're following ignorance and passion. So one should have knowledge and concentrate one's energy on self-realization. Then happiness comes automatically because happiness is not due to enjoying some external objects. Happiness is a state of being where one's consciousness is aligned with the Supreme. And, and that's just the beginning. <laughs> when one actually realizes Brahman, one comes to unlimited happiness. And so this is the actual aim and result of self-realization. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shivaya.